Grace, mercy, and peace are yours in abundance and the overflowing goodness of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, who gives us his words of comfort this afternoon to remind us of what is waiting for us. Read from that final chapter of the Bible, the opening six verses. Then the angel showed me the river of the water of life, as clear as crystal, flowing from the throne of God and of the Lamb down the middle of the great street of the city. On each side of the river stood the tree of life, bearing twelve crops of fruit, yielding its fruit every month. And the leaves of the tree are for the healing of the nations. No longer will there be any curse. The throne of God and of the Lamb will be in the city, and his servants will serve him. They will see his face, and his name will be on their foreheads. There will be no more night. They will not need the light of a lamp or the light of the sun, for the Lord God will give them light, and they will reign forever and ever. The angel said to me, These words are trustworthy and true. The Lord, the God who inspires the prophets, sent his angel to show his servants the things that must soon take place. This is the word of the Lord. As we gather this afternoon, this scripture from that last chapter of the book of the, the Bible really brings us full circle. It brings us back to where it all started, back to a garden garden that we're told of in Genesis chapter 3. For what is the future paradise but return to the original paradise? And what is that gift of eternal life in heaven but really just a restoration of what God originally intended for you, the crown of his creation, to share with him? That is the purpose And the goal is, as we are looking at the gardens, this Lenten journey, the goal and purpose of Jesus' work on earth, this entire Lenten season, we have that garden of paradise, heaven, on the horizon, don't we? Just as our Savior did. For wasn't it for that joy of bringing many sons and daughters to share in that glory that Jesus set his face to Jerusalem, that he endured the cross. And oh, wasn't that on his heart, on his mind, as he spoke to that criminal who was crucified on the cross next to him on that Good Friday, when Jesus said to him, Today, you will be with me in paradise. Heaven on the horizon. And, And isn't that our goal for trusting Jesus too? It's not about making the the world a better place here. We have to just wake up and and just turn on the morning news or the evening news and we see that's not going to happen, not with sinful people in this sinful world. Making our world better here is just a losing cause. But that goal, that horizon ahead of us is that we would hear those same words spoken to us. Welcome. Welcome to the Garden of Paradise awaiting you. And to that end, God had given the Apostle John that vision, that vision to write down for us. And so we read from the last chapter of that vision, the last chapter of the Bible, where God describes in earthly terms what heaven is like. It's not too often that we get a description of heaven. It's really hard to. So often in scriptures, we're just told what heaven is not. But here we have some pictures, some pictures that are meant to encourage us and to strengthen us. Maybe this analogy of a garden that we've been using for this Lenten series gives us a a comparison of of why God did that. Even on a, a rainy day like today, those ardent gardeners are just saying, yep, we need some moisture. That water table needs to be built up. We've been in a drought. We need this rain. Yes, we like the sunshine and the warmer weather, but the rain, we need that too. Why? Because we are looking forward to the bounty of the garden. Looking forward to that first 
ripe, juicy tomato, that crisp, crunchy carrot, and all the other good. And even if you aren't a gardener yourself, maybe you enjoy going to the farmer's market and seeing all those good things that come out of the garden. Well, it's that promise of those good things on the horizon. That what has our minds occupied. That's what we're thinking about. And we forget. We forget all the hard work that you have to endure before you can pick that first ripe tomato. You forget. You don't even think about your aching back from bending over and your, your stiff knee joints from kneeling down and, and your thumbs that get all scuffed up from the pulling the weeds and the thorns and the thistles. No, we're just thinking about what those benefits, the wonderful things we'll enjoy in the same way the Lord gave John this vision to give to us so that knowing what awaits us in heaven gives us the comfort assurance that suffering and, and everything that goes on with living the Christian life here, ah, oh, it's all worth it. The suffering we endure now is not even worth comparing to the glories that await us in heaven, in that garden of paradise. And so the vision, vision that John gave, in, that God gave John a revelation, really takes us back to that garden paradise. But it also is a picture that God used throughout the scriptures. In fact, just as we read about, the Lord had given Ezekiel a vision of a life-giving river flowing from the temple and trees that, whose fruit and leaves were the healing in chapter 47 of Ezekiel's book of prophecy. A reminder that these pictures of revelation are not something new, really just a fulfillment. Thus, the culmination, the completion of what God had planned all along for his people. Well, that first Eden had a river that flowed through the heart of it to water the whole garden. And so we're told this garden paradise has a river too. We, then the angel showed me the river of the water of life, as clear as crystal, flowing from the throne of God and of the Lamb down the middle of the great street of the city. That first Eden had a tree of life that produced fruit that if you ate that fruit, it would sustain eternal life. The vision of paradise and revelation displays on each side of the river stood the tree of life, bearing 12 crops of fruit, yielding its fruit every month. And the leaves of the tree are for the healing of the nations. These two pictures really point to one truth, don't they? The river and the tree. They're pointing to that picture that we're told of next, that no longer will there be any curse. In heaven, the curse of sin is done away with. Sin is no more. Sin is not anywhere to be found. It's gone for good. And so all the perpetrators of sin and all the terrible effects and outcomes of sin, those too are gone. Therefore, the curse of death and hell and Satan and every other kind of suffering are erased. For just like a river of clear crystal water, so Christ's flawless, pure righteousness washes over you and me. It is that water of life that washes our sins away and gives us that gift of life forever. The effects of this, of Jesus' death, will never run dry. In fact, in Ezekiel's vision, the river just got deeper and deeper and deeper as Ezekiel ventured out. And also that tree. Not only does it produce an unending supply of fruit, even the leaves are edible and with healing power. It reminds us of what Jesus said, his great promise of life, when Jesus said, I have come that they might have life and have it to the full. Well, now it's hard to imagine that fullness of life, hard to imagine abundant life with what we're dealing with here. Hard to imagine bodies that aren't hindered by age, that don't feel the wear and tear of time, that, that aren't crippled by sin. Because sin, well, sin is a part of everything in the world around us. 
And because of that, we're not able to fully enjoy even everything that this life has to offer. And if we enjoy anything in this life too much, even good things, even if we enjoy good things too much, we can be enslaved by them, and they could become the death of us. And finally, Finally, we know in this life, whatever we enjoy doing, whether it's work or pleasure, there will come a time when it will all end. But in heaven, in heaven, there will be no, not too much of a good thing. In heaven, there will be perfect satisfaction. In heaven, our enjoyment will never cease. No pleasure will have a a bitter side effect. We won't get bored. We won't get disinterested in time. That truly is amazing. Maybe the closest thing that we can even wrap our minds around it is maybe that experience. Maybe you have had that experience where you got so engrossed, so engaged in something that it, it so took you over that you totally lost track of time. You were doing and working with something, and it was for hours, but it seemed like minutes. That's the maybe the closest thing that we've ever had to experiencing the unimaginable, the infatigable experience of joy that awaits us in heaven, in that garden paradise. The Apostle John alludes to that a little bit when he says that the throne of God and the throne of the Lamb will be in the city, and his servants will serve him. Imagine how awesome it will be in heaven where we will be able to worship our God without the dullness and the drag and the sleepiness of our sinful flesh to weigh us down. Where we will be able to sing full-throated praises to our God. The fact that right now we don't only take God at his word, that we live by faith, not by sight, We only cling to those promises, but in heaven, in that garden paradise, we will see God's own face. The same God who makes these promises to us. It won't any longer be like looking in a mirror or trying to catch a glimpse through the cloud. No, we will have the real thing right before our eyes. For we are told they will see his face and his name will be on their foreheads. That will be the greatest joy of all. That will be the greatest fulfillment, the most greatest satisfaction in heaven. That is the sole object of our faith, that we will be with God, that he will be ours and that we will be his and that nothing will ever come between us. We belong to him and we will be with him. Wasn't that what Peter got so fired up about on that Mount of Transfiguration? And on that Mount, Peter said, Lord, it's good for us to be here. Let's stay here. And Peter was glad he was there. He could build the shelters. He just wanted to keep the Lord with him. In paradise, that will be our joy for all eternity. In paradise, there will be no danger of us losing our salvation. No temptation, no bad influences for us to struggle against. For Scripture says that his name will be on our foreheads. Just as God God claimed us. Just as God called us his own in that wonderful water of baptism, he placed his name on us. So for all eternity we will be marked as his very own. Others will see it and know it, and we will never question it. We are the Lord's. His name is written on us. That will be the ultimate and the greatest joy that we will enjoy for all eternity. Now, every garden needs light to stay green and healthy. And it's no different with this garden of paradise. But know what we're told. There will be no more night. They will not need the light of the lamp or the light of the sun For the Lord God will give them light, and they will reign forever and ever. Our great, awesome God is the source of light. Amazing, he called light into being even before there was a sun or moon or stars, because on that first day of of creation, God said, let there be light, and there was light. 
And then another miracle happens as he brings light into these sinful hearts to believe and trust in him. John looks forward to heaven, and he reminds us in heaven, God will be the only light we need. Even now, Sunday after Sunday, God assures and he strengthens us each time we hear that blessing before we leave worship. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord is assuring us, reminding us of that promise that will be permanent in heaven. Because in Jesus, God smiles on us now. And in heaven, we will be in the throne of God's everlasting light. There, Jesus shares everything, his righteousness, his salvation, his victory, the glory that he has. And because Jesus reigns in heaven, that also means that you and I will reign with him there in heaven. If we ever have difficulties and we feel beaten down in this life, just remember who you are. Remember your importance, your significance, who you really are, that Jesus is your brother that you are sons and daughters of the king. You are God's royalty. And the light of God's grace will shine on you for all eternity as he gives that light of his grace to carry you through this life. That is the comfort and the assurance of that, this last book of the Bible, the book of Revelation. If there's one thing to take away, one thing that summarizes up the book of Revelation, it's, Jesus wins. And isn't that also the, the one takeaway why we go on Lenten journeys each and every year as we revisit those familiar battle scenes? We are reminded of the outcome. Jesus wins. In his final chapter of Revelation, before John signs off, the angel that has guided him through this vision says, These words are trustworthy and true. The Lord, the God who inspires the prophets, sent his angel to show his servants the things that must soon take place. And Jesus himself in that last chapter makes another appearance to verify and validate the message that yes, he wins. As we continue our observation of these solemn days of Lent, and as we draw closer and closer to those dark days of Holy Week, even as we remember looking forward to basking in that joyfulness, that celebration of Easter, may we never lose sight that it's all about what Jesus accomplished for us. By his death and resurrection, Jesus won for you this garden of paradise. In the course of our sufferings and difficulties on this earth, don't lose sight don't lose sight of what God has awaiting you. And remember that all these difficulties, they don't even compare in the least to the glory that awaits you. So God encourages us with this picture of paradise so that we will keep on trusting in Jesus and living for him to the end. For Jesus, your Lord and Savior, promises, yes, I am coming soon. And we and all God's people say, Amen. Come, Lord Jesus. The grace of the Lord Jesus be with God's people. Amen. Please stand. May that everlasting promise of our Lord continue to strengthen and uphold you on your journey to life until you also will stand before the joy and presence of of his throne to worship him for all eternity.